Wisdom webinar series. Savvy is a not-for-profit organization that provides free financial education and resources to women. We are so honored today to have Farnoosh Torabi as our presenter. As a reminder, Farnoosh will take a few questions at the end of her presentation, which you can um, add in um, into the chat area. Farnoosh is a personal finance expert, best-selling author, TV personality, and sought-after speaker. Her mission is to help people take control of their finances so they can live their richest, happiest lives. The New York Times calls her the perfectly practical, and her latest book is the Amazon is an Amazon number one bestseller and is entitled When She Makes More, 10 Rules for Breadwinning Women. Welcome, Farnoosh, and thank you for being here today. So I will hand it over to you now. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thanks for everyone for joining the call, and sorry for uh, my technical challenges, but uh, um, I'm excited to talk about uh, when she makes more to all of you. And if you're not currently making more in your relationship, um, the great news is you might be someday, and um, hopefully the advice that follows will help you uh, just master your finances all the better and improve your relationship along the way. Um, why did I write the book? So just to give you guys some background, we know by now that women are increasingly the chief breadwinners in their families. There have been studies, books, discussions all about this in recent years. The headlines um, all you know, say the same thing, women uh, making more in their relationships. Um, but what we're not discussing, more importantly, I think, is how to make these family dynamics work once uh, she becomes the chief breadwinner. Because the fact of the matter is when she makes more, her relationship faces unique challenges, emotional and financial, that can be potentially damaging. There's actually a higher chance for divorce, infidelity, and feelings of resentment on both sides. I even did my own survey for this book of over 1,000 women in the country, split between uh, female breadwinners and then those who make less than their uh, husbands. And what I found was that when she makes more, she definitely takes on the bulk of the financial decisions and money management in the household, whether she likes doing it or not. And truthfully, sometimes she wishes that she didn't make more, and she feels burned out between working and her home life responsibilities. And for me, you know, as someone who's been helping and coaching people with their finances for over a decade, this was definitely the first time where I saw a true, true complexity that was really shaking things up in relationships to the point where I thought there was not really an established guide or recipe to how to make your partnership succeed. And as someone who is in this demographic as a breadwinner myself, um, this was uh, something that I personally was interested in and frankly could have used the advice as well. So in the next half hour, my goal is to really share some of the financial takeaways from the book. There's a book is really um, a, a book for improving your relationship, and, and in doing that helps you with um, challenges that you face with money, but also housework and childcare and your career. But for the purposes of time and keeping to our, our budget of time, I'm going to focus on just some of the financial takeaways. Um, and then at the end, hopefully answer as many questions as possible. So let's first start with um, some of the top tips from the book and, and why they're important. I, I give a rule in the book called level the financial playing field. This kind of addresses the sort of the financial um, responsibilities and, and, um, uh, and to-dos as well as some of the emotional complexities that might be in play in your relationship if you as a woman uh, are making more. Now, as I mentioned in the, in the earlier slide, when she makes more, we found that she tends to make most of the financial decisions, including investment choices, budgeting, and paying bills. And this is an improvement, and we want to celebrate this because we know that too many women are still not as involved as they should be in their family finances. But it can feel very one-sided, right? I mean, if you're the one that's handling all the bill paying, all the financial choices, whether you're the man or the woman, this can feel like, as I said to my husband at one point, I feel like I'm on this island of when she makes more, very alone, very isolated. And no matter how good you can be at making these decisions, you're in a partnership and you really should kind of make it a team effort and a joint effort. Um, and, and more importantly, when you don't do that, more seriously, you know, it can really disrupt the balance of power in the relationship. Um, whether we like to believe it or not, men can feel pretty insignificant in a relationship when making less. Um, as I found in my book research, they can really question their sense of purpose, in fact, 
in the relationship. So to address these issues, these potential issues, a few considerations. The first is give his money meaning. Now, if as a woman your income is covering a lot of the day-to-day -day cost of your life together, um, it's very easy for your income to overshadow his. But well, you know, if, even if he's making some money, it may not be as much as you, it's still significant, and it's still money that should go towards um, significant things. So rather than kind of willy-nilly delegating his money to, you know, random things like incidentals, I would suggest um, kind of you being the spender and he being the saver in a way where his money can go towards big long-term goals like a vacation, a college fund, a new car, a down payment on a home, or some other big ticket item that the point is he can reflect on that and together you can reflect on that and appreciate that in a big way. You know, it's, his money doesn't get lost in the relationship, in other words. His money really um, takes on special meaning. And um, these allocations uh, from him not only take away the burden on you to fund everything, but it'll be very rewarding for your husband to know that he was, for example, able to send his kids to college or pay for the next, you know, summer vacation. The other advice I have in this category is called delegating duties. Um, you know, what, while every breadwinning woman would do well to monitor finances, that doesn't mean you have to manage it at all, too. Um, both of you should be in the know, but it shouldn't be a very a one-sided management. Uh, while neither of you may enjoy handling the family checkbook, it does make sense to delegate money management to the person who is more interested, better organized, or is simply more frugal. Um, either way, research and anecdotal evidence finds that couples have to make a decision about which one controls the finances, not based on income or gender, and that whoever makes the financial decisions should consult each decision with their spouse. Otherwise, you risk turning the other person off in more ways than one, as I have found. And finally, um, in terms of leveling the financial playing field, I think it's really important to um, have three accounts, mine, yours, and yours, mine, and ours. Um, and I'm going to apologize here for a second because my screen just like went blank, and I don't know if you guys can still hear me. Can you? Hello? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me, guys? I can hear you. You can. Okay. I don't yeah. know what happened. I had a really And I can weird... still and I can still see the slide. So if you want to tell me when to shift it, I can do that. Okay. I apologize. Okay. So um glad I'm still I'm um, able to be heard. So no, I think I think I got this. I don't know for some reason my screen went blank. Um, but I'm back. So finally, another tip is, you know, along the way, as the breadwinning woman, you might feel like, you know, you want to spend your own hard-earned money the way that you want to, and your partner wants to be able to spend his money the way that he wants to. And so how do you do this without, um, you know, running into uh, conflict? Well, three buckets is really the way to manage your money in my book, yours, mine, and our account. So you have an hour account where you're each uh, putting an equal percentage of your income towards a joint account for joint purchases that you both um, you know, have talked about and, and agreed to uh, together paying for. And then you have your account and his account. And for the your and mine account, I think you want to also think about an equal percentage, maybe it's 10 or 15%. And this is you know, your account to spend your money as freely as you want. A lot of arguments I find within marriages erupt after, um, because couples can't decide on how to manage the money, how to spend the money. Uh, she wants to buy herself something, he wants to buy himself something, and they don't agree necessarily on those choices. But this way you can do this, you know, independently, and I really think it can eliminate a lot of unnecessary arguments. Another tip in the book, another rule, is hack the hypotheticals. Um, I found that in the financial world, in your personal financial world, there are things that you can expect, you know, paying bills, investing for retirement, things that you sort of can plan and prepare for. And then there are other things that are a little more miscellaneous or a little more um, circumstantial. So, uh, but nonetheless, I think are really important to talk about with one another. And in particular, when she is the breadwinner, 
um, it can be even uh, more of a consideration. So the first one is a prenuptial agreement. Um, prenuptial agreements are becoming more and more popular. And the reason is because people are getting married later in life and they're coming to marriage with potentially more at stake. And obviously with more women making more, uh, they're becoming more and more curious about protecting their assets when they get married and in the event of a divorce. So a prenup is really something that I think everyone should consider, particularly women who are breadwinners. Um, the fact is, weirdly enough, uh, in some cases, judges are forcing women to pay alimony to their husbands who were making less during the relationship or weren't work, were not working. Um, and if you live in a community property state like California, you know, and you don't have a prenup, you will have to face those that state's 50-50 rule, which is that you know couples have to split assets, even joint debt, 50-50. Uh, and if if you expect to make a lot in your while you're married, or you expect an inheritance, another reason why you might want to protect your assets. If you've got children from a previous marriage that you want to provide for, um, and leave some of your money for them, then definitely need to get a prenup. And you can also do a postnup if you're already married and thinking, uh oh, I didn't get this you can also do a post -nup. Um Dealing with debt is also important. I think for women especially, we're givers, right? And if you have a partner who has debt, our instinct might be to, you know, instantly just write a blank check and say, honey, you know, here's my gift to you. Let's move on with our lives. But I find that that can later on come to haunt you. So if you've got a partner um, who has student loan debt or credit card debt, another way to kind of deal with that together without writing a blank check and potentially enabling bad behavior is to readjust some of how you're spending your money in the relationship. Um, I, I have a tip where, you know, if your husband has debt, um, then maybe you take on some of the, perhaps you take on some of the responsibilities, uh, financial responsibilities, maybe rent or um, anything else that's more significant to kind of ease his uh, plate, take some things off of his plate, so that he can put more of his income towards debt. So you sort of take on more of the spending in the relationship. He takes on more of the debt pay down. Um, and he still has to go through that process, right, of paying off that debt. He has to kind of experience that. And I think that can be a lifelong lesson. In the meantime, you're working together to address the, the debt. And then a third thing about hypotheticals, gifts. You know, as the breadwinner, as the field breadwinner, um, you know, this idea that your husband's going to be able to shower you with gifts and pamper you like maybe some housewives get to be pampered just isn't a reality. And I think that while we know our intelligent brain tells us that we shouldn't care about these things, when you're in a relationship, sometimes it can get to you. And I'll be the one, the first one to admit that it can kind of feel a little one-sided sometimes when it comes to holiday gifting. And in my culture, we're big on gifts. So, um, you know, but, but you have to realize that income has limitations. And so if this is something that's going to be cause a risk between the two of you, you know, I always get you a nice gift, you can't afford me a nice gift, maybe you just need to come up with new rules around gifts, like we're not going to spend money on each other during the holidays. Or if we're going to do something special around the holidays, we're going to do a family trip and we're going to share in the expense of that. Or we're going to set a budget for gifts so we can manage expectations. And I'm not going to give you as my husband, you know, a gold watch, and I'm going to get, you know, um, you know, a dozen roses or whatever it is. If there's income disparity that's really, that's really intense, this could be a really smart solution, again, for avoiding arguments, hurt feelings, all of that. Um, oops. Okay, and then lastly, before we get to questions, I wanted to sneak in a slide about housework and how to manage that with your money and with your time more efficiently. The reason I want to talk about this is because when she makes more, crazy as it sounds, she ends up doing more housework than a woman who makes less or the same as her spouse. And the researchers say part of this has to do with her trying to overcompensate in the housewifery department. Um, as the breadwinner, she may feel like she's a threat to her husband or maybe she comes off too strong or she's neglectful of, you know, the more traditional expectations that her husband might have of her, it's kind of crazy, right? But again, this is sort of a psychobabble that goes on in your head as a breadwinning woman sometimes, and it can be costly. It can cost energy and time and 
um, really your romantic life. Why, you know, spend too much time cleaning toilets when you can outsource it, you know? But, so this is something that I really address hard and well in the book. It's how to address housework. And one of the tool tips is buy yourself a wife. And what do I mean by that? You know, outsourcing is huge. Um, now with the Internet, you can outsource everything from cleaning your home to running errands to organizing your office, and it's money well spent. And the way I always rationalize it is if it's going to cost somebody less, if I have to pay less to get someone to do something for me, then it would cost me to do it. You know, what is your time worth? Then it's worth it. And how, well, how do you actually figure out what your time is worth? Um, I always say take your income, take off the last three zeros, divide by two, that's your hourly wage. So if you make $100,000 a year, Take off those last three zeros, that's 100. Divided by two, that's 50. $50 an hour is about your personal hourly wage. If it's going to cost someone, uh, if it's going to cost you $20 an hour to have someone come in and help you, you know, clean your house or organize your um, office, then it's worth it because that's time that you get back uh, to do something that's maybe more important to you. Don't seek help, seek accountability. What does that mean?